Hi everybody, my name is Josiah, also known as Chilling Silence, and today I want to give a bit of a chat with you about Schnorr signatures in Digibyte 8, and why Schnorr is not a snore. Hopefully you'll find this really interesting, you'll get a lot out of this, and let's get stuck straight into it. So, uh, this presentation is on Schnorr signatures, Taproot, the implications around them, Hopefully, by the end of this, you will be in a position where you will agree that Schnorr signatures are going to be beneficial for Digimite to implement. So, for those of you who are unfamiliar with me, uh, my name is Josiah Speckman, and I do Digibyte things. I've given a number of presentations, such as this one. Uh, I run a YouTube channel where I do daily updates on what's happening with Digibyte. I run the Digibyte and Friends podcast. I do talks at universities, crypto groups. For other streamers, uh, I usually talk about the Gbyte, but also about cryptocurrency and blockchain in general. Now, I am an unpaid volunteer, as we all are with the Gbyte, due to there being no ICO and no centralized entity controlling things on behalf of the Gbyte. The Gbyte is a permissionless blockchain, whereby anybody can speak on behalf of it, and as such, here I am today. So, uh, let's get started with... A little bit of history, first and foremost, before we dive into what Schnorr signatures are and why we want them. So, first of all, Schnorr signatures themselves are not new. They were originally created in the 80s by a German cryptographer by the name of Klaus Schnorr. Uh, he's an absolute genius who retired in 2011 after spending 40 years at the Johann Wolfgang Goethe. Uh, let's hope I pronounce that correctly. University in Frankfurt. Uh, now, he patented Schnorr signatures in 1989. Now, this expired in 2008, Now, which the, the keen-eyed amongst you will notice actually happened uh, about a year before Bitcoin was launched in 2009. Satoshi, it seems, was more interested in utilizing ECDSA. Now, this is probably due to their popularity being more widely understood, uh, due to them being open source, and that's pretty important when you are building an open source and permissionless blockchain. So, however, Klaus wasn't the only one playing around with public key cryptography, and a variant of Schnorr signatures was developed called DSA. Now, this is the digital signature algorithm. This was created by the NSA in the early 90s. It too is patented, but it's royalty free. So DSA was the precursor to ECDSA, which was created in the late 90s with the EC, an EC Dan, an ECDSA, standing for elliptic curve. So, ECDSA, the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, this is what Bitcoin uses, and currently also Digibyte as well. Although it's not quite as good as Schnorr signatures, it's basically good enough, with DSA and ECDSA being very widely used today. So, Schnorr signatures are better than ECDSA for a number of reasons especially now that the patent has expired. First of all, the size. Now, these are a fair bit smaller, which is great for squishing in even more data into the existing block sizes. Now, this is important uh, because it improves the efficiency of the data stored on the blockchain, rather than simply growing the raw block size. Schnorr signatures are not malleable too. Uh, malleable, for those unfamiliar, kind of think of gold. Gold is malleable. You can bend in, you can modify it a little bit. So, uh, Schnorr signatures are not able to be modified and changed as ECDSA signatures are. With the original setup in Bitcoin, the transactions were malleable, and this is what the Mt. Gox exchange claimed caused them to lose hundreds of thousands of Bitcoins, though this has been contested with other studies showing it was under 500 BTC lost, which at the time was worth four-fifths of nothing. Bitcoin used Segregated Witness or SegWit to solve the malleability of transactions, but Schnorr signatures aren't inherently malleable, so that's nice. And it's part of the reason why Bitcoin Cash implemented Schnorr signatures last year. Now, there are mathematical linearity benefits to Schnorr signatures as well, where you can take the effective sum of signatures and verify that they are all legitimate with just one single validation. So that speeds things up a bit. There's a bunch of innovations that this enables, which I'll go into a little bit further later on. Privacy improvements are also a nice addition because every transaction on the blockchain looks the same. So where existing multi-sig addresses are currently beginning with the number three, this could be changed in the future, whereby a multi-sig transaction looks exactly the same as a signed transaction. 
This is the result of the linearity that I mentioned earlier. So with Schnorr signatures, a two of three multi-sig address, your public key doesn't have to be known by the network, nor does the details of who you've entered into this multi-sig arrangement with. Naturally, as a result, this increases the privacy of each person in this multi-sig arrangement. However, with that said, I want to be clear about Schnorr signatures not directly making Digibyte a privacy coin. This is similar to what we did with Dandelion, which Bitcoin has now also implemented, where by we improve the privacy aspects in subtle yet significant ways. And it does definitely open up more avenues in the future. So to clarify with an example, let's say we take Hans, Rutger and Rudy as the creators of a wallet that require two out of three of them to sign a transaction. At the moment, the network would have to know their public key, and we would know that Hans and Rutger were the ones that signed a particular transaction. With Schnorr signatures, it would look like, on the blockchain, just like if it was me making a payment to Rudy. So, we wouldn't know if it was Rudy, Hans, Hans and Rutger, or Rutger and Rudy, fulfilling the requirements for a transaction to be signed by two out of the three of them. All that the rest of the Digibyte network would know is that it is valid, and that it meets the requirements of two out of three. Now, the size of signatures isn't a particularly massive benefit, but when you're talking about a relatively average transaction being, let's say 400 bytes, going from 72 bytes, as we are currently with ECDSA, to 64 bytes with Schnorr signatures, you're looking at a savings of around about 5%. However, if you presume that a full one megabyte block contains 2,500 transactions, as it does currently with Bitcoin, that same block can now hold another 125 transactions without any further improvements. So over time, that adds up to an additional 720,000 transactions per day on the Digibyte network without actually adjusting the block size at a, at a minimum. So that's pretty impressive. Linearity benefits are also subtle, yet they very much play into the size benefits. You can aggregate signatures in a way that you cannot with ECDSA. So this provides even further space-saving benefits. It's not a direct mathematical 2 plus 2 equals 4 that happens with this, but it gives you a bit of an idea of what happens. So again, if we look at our previous example with Rudy, Rutger, and Hans, let's say they make a transaction and we just get it signed, and using Snore, it's either valid or it's not. Say Rudy and Hans make a transaction. They both sign it. There is only one combined signature on the transaction rather than the two individuals. The same would happen if they were in a multi-sig arrangement that required all three of them to sign off on a transaction. Again, there would be only one single signature for the combined. Or perhaps we are a large nonprofit. Let's say we need a 7 out of 10 multi-sig. Now, instead of requiring 7 signatures to be stored in the transaction, they all sign the transaction, and it's effectively added together and aggregated. So the amount of data needed is now only a single 64-byte signature as opposed to the previous 7 times 72 bytes. Or what really has a number of people excited is if we were to sign a block, like the overall block, should it contain all Schnorr signatures, this would mean instead that you could have just one signature to prove the validity of all of the transactions in a block, rather than each individual input being signed. So again, this plays back into both the privacy and the size benefits that we were just talking about earlier. No need to know the public key of all of those people Multi-sig just looks like any other transaction, and we're saving space, and some decent space too. All of these are great benefits, but it does get better. Looking further into the future, there are also possibilities and proposals that have been put forward in the BTC world about how Schnorr signatures could be utilized in a coin join scenario, further obfuscating user inputs and outputs, uh, again, further protecting users' privacy, this, I want to clarify though, is not currently something that we have immediately planned for Digibyte, though it could be implemented on other Digibyte wallets. And again, this is also very different from Mimblewimble, which focuses on fungibility. Now, I'm going to take a slight detour. 
I mentioned Mimblewimble versus a Schnorr-based coin join system because I often get asked about Mimblewimble. Presumably a lot of people have heard about it because of the Harry Potter name, plus it rolls off the tongue a lot better and is simply more catchy than Schnorr. So, Schnorr signature based coin join is very different from Mimblewimble, as Mimblewimble is more specifically about the fungibility of coins, with them being interchangeable. This is quite important when you have a use case of money as your primary focus. Mimblewimble in and of itself does not directly protect against a spectator, somebody viewing the blockchain, from knowing the values and how much you are sending or receiving. So why is fungi uh, what is fungibility and why might fungibility be important? Fungibility is the notion that all coins would be created and treated equally across the board and unable to be distinguished from one another. Think of it more like having marked banknotes being worth less than an unmarked banknote because it's clearly being tracked and traced. A blockchain based example might be the coins from the Cryptopia hack as possibly not being as valuable as freshly minted ones. If you as an end user, for example, were to ever unknowingly receive those coins from the 2019 Cryptopia hack, you might have a harder time getting them accepted and credited into another exchange's wallet, for example. This is what Mimblewimble looks to solve with fungibility, with all coins being created and treated equally. So at this point in time, there is no current intentions to implement Mimblewimble into Digibyte. The focus for now will be on Schnorr signatures. Let's take another bit of a look at, uh, at an example, though, of you being paid your weekly wages by your employer, and your employer decides to get a little bit curious about your spending habits. Now, your employer would not specifically know the amounts that you are paying in rent each week, or in my case, how often you go to McDonald's, if you were to be using a Schnorr-based coin join. On the other hand, Mimblewimble would not specifically prevent your employer from knowing that value. They could probably see that on the blockchain. However, Mimblewimble would mean that if you did ever unknowingly receive some tainted coins, such as those previously involved in the likes of the Cryptopia hack, be it from your work, a friend, and then you should, in theory, have zero problem with another exchange accepting those coins. Both have their important points of differences. Now, Schnorr-based coin join also has the added benefit of auditing and accountability of the blockchain maximum supply when we contrast this against other solutions such as zero-knowledge proofs and Zcash. There's the possibility of inflation bugs going unnoticed in, say, Zcash. There is no such issue with Schnorr-based coin joins for the base layer privacy, further adding to the appeal of Schnorr signatures. Now, where to from here? The path forward is relatively straightforward. Schnorr signatures are not really something that is contentious, even within the Bitcoin world at this point, as they are able to be soft forked in. So, the existing code submitted as part of the BIPs is built against Bitcoin Core 0.19. At present, Digibyte 7.17.2, which is our latest version, is based on Bitcoin Core 0.17. We'll upgrade to make life simpler and pull the changes. It's going to cause a little bit of fun with the Dandelion implementation in Bitcoin being slightly different from Digibytes, but that shouldn't be too difficult for our Rockstar developers. This part here is happening right now. Once we have Digibyte utilizing the Bitcoin 0.19 code, we can then implement these BIPs, Bitcoin Improvement Proposals, a lot easier, pulling in Schnorr signatures to Digibyte. There's currently a bundle with BIP 340, 341, and 342 that all kind of go hand in hand supporting Schnorr signatures, and this is what we will look to be implementing. Finally, after all of that, we'll be merging ProgPow and bringing back GPU mining to Digibyte because this will be a hard fork for the network. All the core wallets are going to need to be upgraded, meaning the underlying infrastructure everywhere will have support for Schnorr signatures. And it will simply be up to third-party wallet and service providers to tweak their software to work with Schnorr signatures. Alternatively though, if they decide they don't want to improve their software, they can still carry on as is, no problem, with Digibyte 8.19 and the existing legacy address formats, or BIC32 and Segwit, for example. 
And again though, as mentioned previously, this is pretty straightforward for the most part, and because it is able to be soft forked in for Bitcoin, the Bitcoin community seems relatively supportive of Schnorr signatures given all of their advantages. I mean, why wouldn't they? There has been significant testing occurring at that level, though more will occur on the Digibyte side of things, confirming our implementation prior to release. So, to close, there are some pretty major benefits in a number of ways, a number of different areas here, and they all tie together quite nicely. These benefits are predominantly size and space saving, the linearity uh, allowing for aggregation and the privacy improvements. So keeping in mind that most end users will never ever know that they are using Schnorr signatures. Most end users simply don't care about the technicalities. That's okay. The ability to have a seamless upgrade is going to be pretty key for Digibyte. And basically at this point, there's no real good reason why not to progress with Schnorr signatures. There's lots of benefits all around while maintaining Digibyte's focus on security as part of its forward thinking nature. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or Telegram. I've been Josiah. Thanks for watching. Cheers.